Hello and welcome. The Setting Apart podcast is a pit stop where you can get nourished, encouraged, and refreshed whenever you need a break. I am your host, IP, and every episode I get to share my stories, my outlook, my reflections on all things inspired through the lens of faith. So grab yourself a coffee, sit back, relax, and chill. It was about midnight. I came across a stranger in the estate as I was taking my dog Spud out for his last walk of the day. I walk Spud three times a day, one in the morning, one in the evening before dinner, and the last one is before my bedtime. My bedtime varies because I like getting some work done in the evening when it's quiet. The stranger whom I've never seen before was seated on the bench at the sheltered walkway. As we were passing by, we said hi to each other and I went on my way. A couple of nights later, I bumped into the same person again. This time around, he was lying on the bench at the fitness park, sound asleep. It was probably between 1 and 1.30 a.m. in the morning. Then, one evening, my wife and I had dinner at a mall near us, and as we were leaving the restaurant, guess what? I ran into the stranger again, seated on a bench just outside the restaurant, all within the mall itself. By this time, I've seen him around the estate a few times, albeit at different timing when walking my dog. And by this time, I suspect that he may be a homeless person. Now, back at the mall, I caught him at the corner of my eye as I was walking past him. Then, something made me stop. I wonder if he's had dinner, I thought. I asked my wife to wait for me at the spot and turned around looking for him. Have you had dinner? I asked. Nope, he replied. Here, go get yourself some dinner. I smiled as I handed him some cash and he thanked me. That was my first conversation with Alan, not his real name, to protect his privacy. When it rains, I worried if Alan has a blanket to keep him warm in the cool of the night. I mean, it could get chilly during the monsoon season. So I went to look for him and found him sleeping on the sheltered bench with the blanket. Good to know there are other good Samaritans around, I thought. You see, I noticed Alan only carries a couple of plastic bags with him um, for a change of t-shirt and perhaps a face towel that he kept in the bags. So he's pretty ill-equipped for cooler temperature. And I went on to portion out the food I cooked earlier to Alan. But this kind of ad hoc goodwill is hardly a viable solution for him. At the suggestion of my wife, I approached the relevant government agency for help. But not after I asked for Alan's consent to get in some assistance. After a couple of phone calls... Alan finally was able to get a proper shelter over his head shortly thereafter. The last time I saw Alan was during a before-dinner walk with my wife and Spud. While we were walking one evening, I heard a chant some distance away. We didn't know what was going on until I spotted Alan waving at me at a distance, shouting, Thank you, uncle! Thank you, uncle! at the top of his lungs. I will never forget that moment. You know, the joy and the satisfaction that I felt was unbelievable. You know, knowing that you've made a difference in someone's life, albeit in a very, very small way. I was rejoicing with Alan. It was a touching moment, but also embarrassing because he was shouting so loudly, it was kind of embarrassing. And that was the last I saw of Alan. I pray that he is in good hands now. For those of you who are here for the first time, a big hello and warm welcome to you. The Setting Apart or SAP family is a small online community of fellowship. And we hope to grow our community one listener at a time. 
。So if you like what you hear, please subscribe and share the podcast with your friends. Now, the reflection I shared is inspired by this episode's reading from Tobit chapter one. Starting this episode, I'll be covering the seven deuterocanonical books in the Catholic Bible. What is deuterocanonical? It is the second canon of inspired books in the Bible. To find out a little bit more about them, I actually have a very brief overview of how they came about in episode one of this season. Please feel free to check it out. And if you want to have a deeper dive into the subject matter, I would encourage you to do so on your own. Now. The Bible I'm reading from is the New American Bible or the NAB online version, taken from the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops or the USCCB website. I will leave a link below for your reference. I invite you to read along with me if you can. And for those of you who have a Catholic Bible, you can use whatever version you have to read along. And for those who do not have a Catholic Bible, you are welcome to read along using the online version from the USCCB website, or you can just chill and listen. Now I have a brand new feature this season for the podcast. Starting this season, our podcast will also be available on YouTube channel. So please tell your friends and families about it. The neat thing about YouTube is that you can listen and read along with the closed caption on YouTube. So essentially, that could be another option for you to listen to and read along on YouTube. I will leave the YouTube link below for your reference. Now let us begin with a brief opening prayer before we listen to the Word of God. In the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to gather here in your name to listen attentively to you, as it is written, as your word unfolds, it gives light. Even the simple understand. We pray that the Holy Spirit in our midst could guide us in opening our ears and our heart to be enlightened by your word. Speak, Lord, your servant. Is listening. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Tobit, chapter one. This book tells the story of Tobit, son of Tobiel, son of Hananiel, son of Aduel, son of Gabiel, son of Raphael, son of Raguel, of the family of Asiel and the tribe of Naphtali. During the days of Shalmaneser, king of the Assyrians, he was taken captive from Thisbe, which is south of Kedesh Naphtali in Upper Galilee, above and to the west of Asia, north of Phagor. I, Tobit, have walked all the days of my life on paths of fidelity and righteousness. I performed many charitable deeds for my kindred. And my people, who had been taken captive with me to Nineveh, in the land of the Assyrians, when I lived as a young man in my own country, in the land of Israel, the entire tribe of my ancestor Naphtali broke away from the house of David, my ancestor, and from Jerusalem, the city that had been singled out of all Israel's tribes, that all Israel. Might offer sacrifice there. It was the place where the temple, God's dwelling, had been built and consecrated for generations to come. All my kindred, as well as the house of Naphtali, my ancestor, used to offer sacrifice on every hilltop in Galilee to the calf that Jeroboam, king of Israel, had made in Dan. But I alone. Used to go often to Jerusalem for the festivals, as was prescribed for all Israel by long-standing decree, bringing with me the first fruits of crops, the firstlings of the flock, the tithes of livestock, and the first shearings of sheep. I used to hasten to Jerusalem and present them to the priests, Aaron's sons, at the altar. To the Levites ministering in Jerusalem, 
I used to give the tithe of grain, wine, olive oil, pomegranates, figs, and other fruits. Six years in a row, I used to give a second tithe in money, which each year I would go to pay in Jerusalem. The third year tithe I gave to orphans, widows, and converts who had joined the Israelites. Every third year, I would bring them this offering, and we ate it in keeping with the decree laid down in the Mosaic law concerning it, and according to the commands of Deborah, the mother of my father Tobil, for my father had died and left me an orphan. When I reached manhood, I married Anna, a woman of our ancestral family. By her, I had a son whom I named Tobiah. Now, after I had been deported to the Assyrians and came as a captive to Nineveh, all my kindred and my people used to eat the food of the Gentiles, but I refrained from eating that Gentile food. Because I was mindful of God with all my heart, the Most High granted me favor and status with Shalmaneser, so that I became purchasing agent for all his needs. Until he died, I would go to Media to buy goods for him there. I also deposited pouches of silver worth ten talents in trust with my kinsman Gabriel, son of Gabri, who lived at Rogers in the land of Media. When Shamanizah died and his son Sennacherib came to rule in his stead, The roads to Media became unsafe, so I could no longer go to Media. In the days of Shamanizah, I had performed many charitable deeds for my kindred, members of my people. I would give my bread to the hungry and clothing to the naked. If I saw one of my people who had died and been thrown behind the wall of Nineveh, I used to bury him. Sennacherib returned from Judea, having fled during the days of the judgment and necked against him by the king of heaven because of the blasphemies he had uttered, whomever he killed, I buried. For in his rage he killed many Israelites, but I used to take their bodies away by stealth and bury them. So when Sennacherib looked for them, he could not find them. But a certain Ninevite went and informed the king about me, that I was burying them, and I went into hiding. When I realized that the king knew about me and that I was being hunted to be put to death, I became afraid and took flight. All my property was confiscated. I was left with nothing. All that I had was taken to the king's palace except for my wife Anna and my son Tobiah. But forty days did not pass before two of the king's sons assassinated him and fled to the mountains of Ararat. A son of his, Esahadon, succeeded him as king. He put Ahika, my kinsman Anel's son, in charge of all the credit accounts of his kingdom and he took control over the entire administration. Then Ahika interceded on my behalf, and I returned to Nineveh. Ahika had been chief cupbearer, keeper of the signet ring, treasury accountant, and credit accountant under Sennacherib, king of the Assyrians. And Esahadon appointed him as second to himself. He was, in fact, my nephew of my father's house and of my own family. For those of us who have experienced God's mercy and His unconditional love, we know God is love. And we know that we must love the Lord our God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, and with all of our might. But how exactly do we do that? How do we love and glorify our God? This is where Tobit chapter 1 stands out for me. 
It is a blueprint as to how loving God might look like. Tobit, a Jewish exile in Nineveh, is extraordinarily faithful to God. But his faith is not an empty faith, but goes hand in hand with good works. However, the consequence of some of his good works brought about personal tragedies. Yet he remains unfazed in his faith because it is driven by his love of God. And in the end, God protects him and restores Tobit from his tragedies. Now, to better appreciate his faith, we must first understand Tobit's background. Tobit's ancestor was from the tribe of Naphtali and a part of the Jewish exile generation in Nineveh. As a side note, Naphtali was one of the very first tribes of the northern kingdom of Israel deported by the Assyrians to Nineveh, a capital city of Assyria. The context of Naphtali is significant because in Matthew chapter 4, when Jesus begins his public ministry, he begins the restoration of the lost tribes of Israel starting in Capernaum in the land of Zebulun and Naphtali. In other words, Jesus begins from where the very first tribes were lost. And this is to fulfill the Old Testament scripture. You see how the Bible works? The new is hidden in the old, and the old is revealed in the new. As such, to appreciate and understand the New Testament, it really helps to know the Old Testament. And that's why we are here. And in Tobit, uh, chapter 1, verse 4, the entire tribe of Naphtali broke away from the house of David and from Jerusalem. And this refers to the split of the 12 tribes of the United Kingdom of Israel into two kingdoms the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. With ten tribes of the northern kingdom of Israel led by Jeroboam and the two tribes of the southern kingdom of Judah led by Rehoboam after the death of King Solomon. And if you recall, Rehoboam was a grandson of King David and a son of and a successor to King Solomon. So that's the context on Naphtali. After the split, Jeroboam of the northern kingdom of Israel actually built two state temples with golden calves, one in Bethel and the other one in Dan for his people to worship in, instead of worshiping in the temple in Jerusalem, which was built by King Solomon as the dwelling place for God in place of the tabernacle from Moses. And this is why Tobit still makes his way to Jerusalem to worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In verses 5 to 6, we see that despite the fact that his fellow countrymen um, were worshiping the golden calf built by Jeroboam and Dan, Tobit continues to make pilgrimages to and worship in the Jerusalem temple. Essentially, the new kingdom of Israel has abandoned worshipping the one true God of Israel by worshipping the pagan gods instead. So to appreciate um, Tobit's fidelity to God, I looked up the distance between Jerusalem and Nineveh. It's about 550 to 600 miles apart. And assuming if it makes a constant walking pace of 2.5 miles per hour for 8 hours a day, that would take about 30 days or one month of one-way travel from Nineveh to Jerusalem. And if he were to travel on a caravan, say, at double the pace of 5 miles per hour for 8 hours a day, that would shorten the one-way travel time by half to about 2 weeks. So the total time taken to travel back and forth alone would be about one month via the caravan. Now, I don't know about you, but that's a long time to travel just to worship your God. Not exactly a walk in the park. And I'm not even taking the terrain into consideration here. Clearly, if the routes are hilly, the time taken will be longer as the pace could be considerably uh, slower. And so today, we are like Tobit. 
You know, we are in exile from our Heavenly Father. As a consequence of the original sin, we have been broken away from our ancestral heavenly kingdom. Now, we know how we can restore our relationship with the Heavenly Father. But can we be steadfast like Tobit, taking the road less traveled? To remain faithful to the one true God who is not of this world? Or are we succumbing to the secular way, worshipping the pagan gods of this world in our time? The God of wealth and prosperity, the God of lust, and the God of pride. Something to think about and reflect on. From the first few lines, not only does Tobit make a long pilgrimage from Nineveh to Jerusalem to worship and to make offerings to the God of Israel, in obedience to the Mosaic law, it seems he is the only one among his kindred to do so. Clearly, he is set apart from his fellow countrymen. In keeping with the tradition, he offers the very best first fruits of his crops and flocks to Yahweh. But that's not all. He also gives tithes to the Levites, the widows, the orphans, and the converts in Jerusalem. And he refrains from eating food that was prohibited in accordance to the Mosaic tradition. Now, the fact that Tobit gives tithes to the priests in Jerusalem is also significant. As you may recall, Levites are the priestly tribe of Israel. They are the descendants of Aaron who were not allotted any land from Joshua like the 12 tribes after they have settled in the promised land. The idea is that the Twelve will look after the Levites since their vocation is to worship the Lord and to administer to the people of God. Clearly, Tobit is not a man of empty faith, but a man of conviction. He would give bread to the hungry, clothe the naked, and bury the dead. Now, burying the dead is to help preserve the dignity of his fellow countrymen albeit at great personal cost to him. Here we see the doctrine of faith and works in action. Clearly, this is not a new Christian doctrine that is exclusive to the New Testament, but rather it is an old teaching found all over the Old Testament. Let me give a couple examples. The first one here is from Proverbs chapter 19, verse 17, and it reads as follows. The one who is gracious to the poor lends to the Lord, and the Lord will repay him for his good deeds. The next one is from Isaiah 58, verse 10. If you give some of your own food to feed those who are hungry and to satisfy the needs of those who are humble, then your light will rise in the dark, and your darkness will become as bright as the noonday sun. So, when you help someone who is in need, not only will the Lord repay you for your good deeds, even your darkness will become as bright as the noonday sun. Wow, that's pretty awesome. However, Tobit's good deeds also brought him and his family some tragedies as a result of burying the dead. He was hunted down to be put to death, lost all his personal wealth, and his family was forced to flee from Nineveh. For what? For burying strangers whom he probably doesn't even know, right? But they are his kindred and his people. What a guy. And so today, just because we are baptized and became a Christian, that doesn't mean that life will be easy and we're going to be in autopilot mode. In fact, Jesus tells us in no uncertain terms, if anyone wants to be a follower of mine, let him renounce himself and take up his cross every day and follow me. And that's from Luke chapter 9, verse 23. Now, if you know the cross, it is anything but easy. And we got to deny ourselves and take up our cross every day. That will be a good topic to dive into another day. But Jesus saves us from the evil one, but not from our sufferings. At the end of chapter 1, though, 
we see that God protects Tobit from King Sennacherib, who wanted Tobit dead for burying the dead, and restored Tobit back to Nineveh when Sennacherib was assassinated. So, in Tobit chapter 1, we see that Tobit is a man of great faith. Notwithstanding that Naphtali is separated from the house of David and Jerusalem, and despite Nineveh is quite a distance away from Jerusalem, Tobit religiously makes his pilgrimage to the temple in Jerusalem to worship and to give alms in obedience to the Mosaic tradition and law. And he is also a man of good deeds. He would feed the hungry, clothe the naked, help the widows and the orphans, and give tithes to the priests, the sons of Aaron, in Jerusalem. He became a wanted man because of his faith and good works, to preserve the dignity of his slave kindred. I don't know about you, but I reckon Tobit is a good example of how to be set apart for us. To remain steadfast in our covenantal truth with our Heavenly Father and not to succumb to all the misinformation and disinformation of the secular world. Remember, we may be in this world, but we are not of this world. My question then becomes, how is it that Tobit can remain so resolute in his faith? That is the question. What do you think? For me, the answer lies in verse 12 when he says, Because I was mindful of God with all my heart. You see, all of Tobit's actions are driven by the love of God. And the Shema immediately comes to mind. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your might. And so, it is a reminder for us today. To be mindful of anyone in our heart, we must have a relationship and then be in love in the first place. So, to be mindful of God with all my heart, we must first love God. And to love, as we unpacked in season one, is to will the good of another. According to St. Thomas Aquinas, God is infinitely good and perfect. And so there's nothing more we can do for God. But what we can do is to do what God loves, which is to will the good of your neighbor, or simply love your neighbor. And this is the secret behind Tobit's fidelity to God. He loves his neighbors because he loves God. Likewise, Mother Teresa serves the poor and the destitute because she loves Jesus. And so, connecting the dots to my testimony, I have two key takeaways. First, to be mindful of God with all my heart. I served the homeless man because I love Jesus. And I love Jesus because Jesus loved me first. To love Jesus, I must love my neighbor. It is the faith that drives the good works, not the other way around. In Luke 14, verses 13 to 14, Jesus says, When you hold a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind. Blessed indeed will you be because of their inability to repay you. For you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Sounds familiar? It is taken in the same vein to Proverb chapter 19, verse 17, which we just covered. So for ease of reference, this is what it says. The one who is gracious to the poor lends to the Lord, and the Lord will repay him for his good deeds. You see, some of the teachings of Jesus in the New Testament are based on the wisdom of the Old Testament. As St. Augustine puts it eloquently, the new is hidden in the old and the old is unveiled in the new. When I reached out to Alan, there was no expectation from him, but that he would at the minimum 
get some basic needs in place so that he may preserve his dignity in the hope that with a little bit of help, Alan can perhaps focus on improving the quality of his life. Faith and good works go hand in hand. As Christians, we cannot just talk the talk. Like Tobit, we must walk the talk. And we must do so cheerfully. Second, the joy of helping those in need. Think of the times you've been given help in your lifetime. Think about it. How did that make you feel when someone comes to your aid to offer the help that you need? Remember that? Now, imagine if you were the giver, the joy and the satisfaction you get when you make a difference in someone's life is simply priceless. On my testimony, it's not about what I did. I really didn't do much at all. And here's the point I'm trying to make. Even with that little that I did, the joy that I felt seeing Alan's reaction, hmm, it's truly special. If you do not know what I'm talking about, you should try it out sometime and let me know how you feel. At the end of the day, we are either going to be the sheep or the goat when we are judged as in the parable in Matthew 25. What's it going to be? Will you be the sheep or the goat? Last but not least, the message I got from Toby chapter 1 is that God is always near. From the last two verses, 21 and 22, Tobit returns to Nineveh in less than 40 days when Sennacherib is assassinated. God restores Tobit's tragedies because God is love and God is faithful. Just because we cannot see God, it doesn't mean that God is absent. If God is faithful to us when we are unfaithful to Him, imagine how much more God will be there for those who remain faithful in Him. Now, God is faithful because God is love. And the prophet Isaiah tells us that God also takes delight in you and He rejoices in you. And so today, how faithful are we to God? When God is out of our sight, is He out of our mind? When our prayers are unanswered, or as we are going through a rough patch, or when things do not go our way and we are really, really struggling, do we just give up and seek other gods? Or are we going to be like Tobit, who remains true to the teaching of the one true God, no matter what, taking the road less traveled? Even when Tobit was being hunted down, losing all his wealth and fleeing from his hometown, that is, he's going through his trials and tribulations, God is never far. Ultimately, with the grace of God, Tobit is restored at the end of chapter 1. In summary, Tobit's fidelity to God is indeed exemplary to all Christians. He is a man of conviction, who is a practitioner of faith and good works. And he is obedient to the Mosaic tradition and law. His faith is driven by his love for God. And like us, he is not exempted from personal trials and tribulations either. But with the grace of God, Tobit, is restored in his righteousness in the end. And so like Tobit, may we love and glorify God by our lives, by simply walking the talk. Love God, love your neighbor. In closing, let's pray. Father, thank you for giving us Tobit. May we remain faithful in you always and to love you unconditionally like how you are to us, no matter what sufferings we may endure. In Jesus' name we pray.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you for listening to the Setting Apart Podcast. If you like what you hear, please subscribe and get notified so you won't miss any new episodes. And please feel free to give me your ratings and reviews so that others may get to listen as well. Thank you and God bless.